Hi, and welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. This is Jason Watt. In this episode, we're going to be talking to uh, Curtis Finlay and Ed Skarik. Um, this episode will be good for a whole bunch of credits. This is a good one for credits. Uh, we'll have, of course, insurance credits in all jurisdictions, including accident and sickness credits in Alberta. This will be good for a financial planning credit from FP Canada. It'll be good for a credit from Advocus on the IAS side. And it'll be good for a compliance credit on the IROC side. Uh, this is the nice thing about these uh, sort of regulatory affairs discussions is they're pretty easy to get uh, credits for. Um, now, a couple of comments here. Curtis, who I interviewed in this episode, is a friend. Curtis and I have known each other for well over a decade. Um, I tried to actually go see him. He's in retirement now, and he lives uh, in Southern Ontario. I tried to get to see him when I was... Uh, about 30 kilometers from his house in August, but uh, we just couldn't make it work. But I will get out there to see Curtis uh, in retirement. I just drove, drove through his old hometown here in Alberta a couple weeks ago. And then this was my first time meeting Ed, and I really thought Ed brought a ton of value here. Um, I may have met Ed in passing, like uh, just at a conference here or there, but we've certainly never had a conversation like this. So I learned a ton in here. Um, I thought it was a great conversation listening to the recording. I can't believe how much ground we covered. Um, Ed is incredibly knowledgeable. Curtis is so insightful. So that was uh, just wonderful that way. Um, the object for today this is like a humble brag here, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, so this is a, where are we at there? There we go. A photograph of me. I'm flying over the mountains uh, about, that'd be about 150 kilometers um, sorry, east of Port-au-Prince in Haiti. Um, I had flown out there. That's a Canadian helicopter. I can't remember. I took one leg there with a, an American helicopter and one leg with a Canadian helicopter, but I was on uh, an operation in Port-au-Prince, Haiti in 2004, and there was not the earthquake that everybody will remember. If I remember right, that was 2006, but uh, there was an earthquake sort of in the mountains in a more rural area and it caused a bunch of landslides and we flew out to help establish some relief efforts. Um, it was a, an interesting day, hard day. There's a, um, not, not necessarily hard physically, but uh, you know, hard to see how people um, deal with situations like that. And, you know, one of many things, although I know Canada, we have plenty of people dealing right now. I'm recording this uh, as the BC floods are ongoing, but uh, you know, you see the difference in a place like that where the infrastructure is not great and where people are living quite disconnected lives and then you get, you know, you dump thousands of tons of rock on the town you live in, it's, uh, it, it creates some real adverse outcomes real quickly. Um, so anyways, it was an interesting day. I like that picture. I'll just show my ridiculous difference in my hairline here. So you can see there I had like uh, the hairline of a dashing young cavalry officer and uh, today I don't. Um, all right, let's uh, delve into the interview. Thanks so much. Hi, I'm joined today by Ed Squarek and Curtis Finlay. Um, Ed is a uh, law professor and a uh, adjudicator with the Financial Services Tribunal and a little bit of freelancing, I guess, if you need a security slash regulatory affairs lawyer, Ed, you're somewhere in the mix there. Yes. And then uh, Curtis Finlay. Curtis is a retired advisor slash branch manager slash compliance officer. Um, used to be in, well, you were in the business all over the country, I guess, but most recently out in uh, Calgary, Canmore area, Curtis, and now retired. And I think you're pretty retired, aren't you, Curtis? <laughs> That's right. I've crossed the bridge. <laughs> all right. Perfect. Um, so can you just give us a quick introduction of who you both are? I think we'll start with Ed here. Sure. Uh, thank you, Jason, and thanks for inviting me to participate. Um, so as Jason said, I am a lawyer um, specializing in securities law, but I also have a background in insurance. I work primarily out of Toronto, although I am involved in securities and insurance um, regulation across Canada and the various jurisdictions. And Even Quebec, Ed, I have to ask? Oh, that's an excellent point. Um, not as deeply in Quebec. The common law is quite different, but absolutely there's some involvement with Quebec. Okay, interesting. I, I mean, I know it's a, a whole different world on the regulatory side, right? So. Yeah. 
Yeah. Civil law, not common law, pardon me. That's, yeah, no, I knew what you meant. Yeah, thanks. And uh, Curtis, how about yourself? Yeah, and as well, Jason, thank you for the invitation. Um, so my background over 40 years, I spent a lot of time coaching advisors uh, and then the framework around regulation tended to be something that fell towards me. So um, my involvement in this particular subject today, aside from the client backgrounds, would be uh, you know, years of being on associated on um, committees nationally, uh, chairing them for giving feedback to regulators on change in the industry. Uh, I was also heavily involved with the technology area in terms of the new uh, changes coming out in the industry. Yep. So that's kind of a broad background, but to give you sort of that, I, I taught some CE credit courses, um, not as in depth as you did, uh, but I was always involved with you know, coaching, oversight over advisors, and then working with my own clients as well. And I was always impressed, Curtis, over the years with your sort of marriage of the advisor's perspective to the compliance perspective. And I think the folks that you worked with always appreciated that. And honestly, you had a, a great handle on technology. So yeah, that's uh, Thank you. yeah, just wonderful to always have you in sessions. I always enjoyed it. Um, and can we start off then with you know this idea of perspective, right? Shared perspectives or sometimes different perspectives. And I'm interested in, because I think you both have a good ability to look at two sides or more than two sides of a picture. So what do you see that maybe dealers and advisors don't fully appreciate about the positions that regulators take in this country? And I don't, if you want to start us off there, Ed? Sure. The regulators, it's, it's being a regulator and having been a regulator in the past in my earlier career, it's not an easy job. Um, you really have the, in, talking from the security side, the per, principles and purposes of the act are set out in the statute. So you're bound by those. Um, one of them is you know, to ensure that clients are treated um, properly, fairly, um, and that registrants are of a sufficient um, proficiency um, and and uh, and character, and that their conduct is is uh, of a high standard. Using that as the basis for operating from the regulatory perspective, um, it often can come across to the advisor that the regulator is being awfully paternalistic and and uh, beyond paternalistic, um, really prescriptive in the way they deal with things. That is a result of the actual purpose and principles in the act and the standard uh, philosophical approach to dealing with regulation that I think the, reg the, the regulated community, the financial advisor and planner may not always appreciate, but that is changing and principles-based reg principles regulation is, is moving us from that. But I think that that dynamic is something that's not fully understood or appreciated. Yeah, I'd like to delve into principles-based regulation a little bit more, but Curtis, do you have anything to add to Ed's comments there? Yeah, I mean, I would just say that the average industry person uh, sometimes finds it somewhat stressful that, you know, it seems like profit and revenue is a dirty word and that uh, the regulators do tend to forget that this revenue is not only paying for advisors' incomes, but it's paying for staff costs, including uh, keeping the very rec records that the requirements in the regulations require to get done. So, um, you know, revenue and profit are not dirty words and, and protecting the consumer is in everyone's best interest, especially the industries. So I, I think it's a little bit too much of push and not a little bit of pull. And I, I think at some point, um, advisors being sort of the low person on the totem pole, it seems like everything funnels to the dealer and then advisors are being treated a little bit too much like chattels sometimes, mm. uh, like owned and controlled by the dealer. Yeah, I and I get that. I think that's a, that's a very, say, um, eloquent way to express the, uh, the comments that I hear from a lot of advisors. Um, so yeah, that's helpful, Curtis, thanks. Ed, can I have a question maybe before we go down this road of principles-based regulation? So, you know, I always think about this. We see these cases, and I see them today, where 
you have an advisor who has done something untoward, right? Yes. And we and you look at the the I'm going to say punishment. I know that's not necessarily, but let's say the punishment. And it seems like a lot of times with the most public of cases that the punishment doesn't fit the crime. And I find that the ones that tend to get a lot of attention are the ones where the punishment is uh, too lenient, right? So I you know I saw a case recently where like an advisor had um, forged a number of client signatures and gets a one year ban, right? Which to me seems woefully inadequate. Um, you know, as a regulator, like when you were looking at that from the regulator's perspective, it, did you look at sometimes cases and say, uh, you know, like we know we should have the right to do more here. You talked about the legislation, but you know, we're handcuffed by legislation or we're handcuffed by some other idea here. How, how does that kind of hit you as a regulator? Um, that's a really good question and, and not an easy one to answer. The rules have changed, um, certainly in Ontario, when, I, when you look at the FSRA in terms of their ability to, um, to institute um, fines for wrongdoing. I believe they go up to $100,000 now per um, transgression. And if it's for a company, and I think for an individual, it may be 50,000 per transgression. So when it comes to the point where it's going to be heard before a panel, um, the enforcement branch will come forward um, with their proposal uh, of what the, the punishment should be, um, and, and then leave it to the committee, the panel, to make the final determination. What I am seeing though, uh, certainly with the conduct branch and the enforcement branch of the FSRA is that they're actually moving that needle from being too lenient and moving closer to the maximum penalties that can be um, assigned under any transgression um, and then leaving it to the panel, the, the financial services tribunal to make that determination for them. So because the FSAR is, FSRA is new, there's a bit of feeling out I think going on right now but I think there is on the um, on the insurance side uh, um, a move by the regulator to more properly address all transgressions. And I'd also add the complexity of the cases now are getting um, greater as well. They, you know, these are not simple cases anymore. So you're getting some of the bigger players who are offside brought forward now, which at one point, uh, perhaps it was at the... Um, Financial Services Commission that was prior to the FSRA didn't have the staffing resources to perhaps go after the big players as much as they may now. Interesting. That's, so now can you uh, give us a little primer on principles-based regulation? Absolutely. So um, principles-based regulation is in a consideration uh, a that operates from a different set of principles than prescriptive. Prescriptive is when you have the, you know, the letter of the law written. It's um, very clear what the expectation is. So when it comes to compliance, it's a matter of have I met the letter of the law? If you have, tick the box, you're good. Principles-based regulation is different in that it's drafted in a less legalistic way. Um, it's drafted focusing on a general principle or outcome that you're trying to achieve which then means that you are looking at the spirit of the law as opposed to just the letter of the law. Um, and then that approach actually moves the responsibility in a large part from the regulator to the regulated community to establish the best practices in interpreting the principles that underlie the, uh, the legislation or the regulation in question. So I want to come back to this when we delve into client focused reforms a little bit, because I, mean, I think that's, if I'm reading this correctly, that's a pretty strong example of principles based regulation. Okay, yeah. Excellent example. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, Curtis, do you have anything to add to Ed's comments there? Yeah, just basically the industry, for the most part, would prefer principles based in a number of cases. Um, primarily, I like it because it creates a, a, an entrepreneurial and potentially um, advantageous situation. If you're creative and you're running a firm, uh, you, you still have to solve the problem. You still have to provide the right solution, but the way you go about doing it might be creative and might be better than what another firm can do. 
And so it gives you the opportunity to then attract really good, solid professional advisors who like the way the framework and the way you work. If everyone is doing the exact same procedures and being audited and ordered to follow the exact same procedures, then there's really no point in, in comparing one firm to another because they're really just doing it all the exact same thing. Yeah, this is a good point. Now, I just want to touch on FP Canada in this context a little bit because FP Canada is not a regulator. But, you know, Ed, when you are going through this, you're talking about kind of setting industry standards as a way to say, okay, what, what principles do we want to be adhering to or how do these principles play out? This makes me think that an organization like FP Canada that does put a lot of work into having professional standards and so forth, do they end up in a kind of semi-regulatory role? Is that the outcome here? It is. It, it, it moves you along that continuum from just a market participant to a self-regulatory body. You're not fully a self-regulatory body, but you are playing a role now. Um, and when you say the FP Canada is not a regulator, but when you look at the, the new legislation being considered for title protection, um, if they become a credentialing body, which I can't imagine them not becoming, then they're going to have oversight of conduct. And that makes them, that puts them squarely on the path towards becoming an SRO, a self-regulatory organization. You know what this reminds me of, Curtis, I don't know if you remember this or not, but when FP Canada first came out with the projection assumption guidelines, um, you and I had a conversation about this. Do you recall that, Curtis? It's like five or six years ago now, but do you, does this ring any bells for you? Uh, no. <laughs> so I, I remember you expressing a concern about this because you had said, hey, look, now FP Canada has this projection assumption guidelines. Does that become like a standard of performance or does that, does that set oh, yeah. sort of a bar that you know, you really have, at the time, I think there were four people sitting on the committee that generated that document where, like, is that a small number of people who have an outsized amount of influence, right? And, you know, I, this makes me wonder about maybe a, an unintended consequence here. So, I, I don't know, I, I hate to bring something back from so long ago, Curtis, but I thought it was a good comment at the time. And I've always kind of thought about that every time I look at the projection assumption guidelines. I think any time that somebody who's not really given the authority to do something or sitting on a committee and they're influencing the entire industry, I mean, not just FD Canada, but really anyone in that role, it, we do create a problem. Um, and, and those guidelines have been now more or less accepted, uh, you know, as a, as a way we're doing business. Yeah, that's yeah. good. It, Thanks. Yeah. Sorry, I go ahead, Ed. Yeah. That as well. Um, the courts, when they're looking at things like a common law fiduciary duty, one of the elements they look at are the rules um, that are in place with um, industry associations or educational bodies. So to Curtis's point, that's absolutely right. And the courts are looking to them now as well and making determinations on very significant uh, um, decisions that impact business. That's a good point, right? That you know, whether it's uh, regulatory or not, it's part of the common law. Right? That's right. It's, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, now, can we delve a little bit into client-focused reforms here? So this sure. is sort of the news of the day, and uh, this episode will go live right about the time the last changes for client-focused reforms uh, sort of uh, get seated. So I'm going to start with, I, I don't know if this is a fair question to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyways. And I think I'll start with you here, Curtis. Do you think that they'll accomplish the intended outcome? You know, it's a difficult question because there's so many different items all into this large basket, right? You know, there's a lot of policies there. Uh, I would say I'm optimistic that some, some of the things will work out. Uh, for example, I, I think it's great news that we're finally accepting or we're moving towards a broader range of suitability, for example. We're, we're finally acknowledging that we can have two people, uh, different ages, uh, different financial situations. They both answer the questions honestly with their advisor. They both are currently rated in the same risk classification, yet their, their personal risks to return 
if, you, if they have a loss, their ability to absorb that loss is significantly different. And then their, therefore their response to a correction in the market is completely different. So we are finally starting to look at that. And I, I think that's a positive, you know, um, there's aspects of this I have a, some concerns over for sure. But, but if I can just briefly, I, I just want to tell you the thing I like best about this. Um, by, if you look at the subjects, uh, the KYC um, product selection process that they describe in another section, an area of resolving conflicts to the best interest of, of clients, um, proprietary products and how they're treated, uh, referrals to third-party service providers and, and PMs, um, concentration risk that I just mentioned. It, the one thing they all have in common is it requires a higher level of professional judgment by advisors. This is a good thing. And I, and I know that puts stress on advisors, but people like Ed and I, and, and Jason, I know you as well, we've been beating the drum here for years talking about raising the bar. You know, it's time for advisors to mature into more of a profession. And maybe the regulators have somewhat gotten a little tired of waiting for the industry to voluntarily do it quick enough. And so now they're forcing it to happen. And by raising the bar and forcing better professional judgment, that improves the, hopefully the outcomes and the experience for the consumer and maybe gives the industry an argument for one day saying, hey, we're a profession and we should be acknowledged as such. So, so you know, although it maybe isn't fun to have something layered upon you, maybe some of these things are necessary. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, Curtis, the advisors that you and I know, I, I think are going to be very little impacted by this. Um, and maybe I'm wrong there, but I think if you're sort of, if you're running your business a certain way, there may be, be some tweaks here and there. You might do some different reporting. You might pick up a couple software packages. But I think a lot of the advisors you and I know, Curtis, are going to see the same like their day-to-day their -day is not going to change that much. I don't know. Ed, do you have any thoughts? A, oh, sorry, go ahead, Curtis. I apologize. I, I would say it's increased administration perhaps. And, it, you know, so it's more of a, um, you know, some more tasks to do. And depending on the product that you usually provide the consumer, like whether you use third-party investment solutions or whether you're using um, something that might be, package together a proprietary product by your, your dealer, you might have to start rethinking some of the tools you use as an advisor. But I would, I would concur that most professional advisors will embrace this. And if anything, um, when I read it carefully, the, the people who tend to be looking at perhaps more change than others are probably the bank owned IROG dealers. Um, I, I think that if anyone, they're the ones with the most number of adjustments that have to be made. Yeah, I think that when you have, I mean, a big organization like that with pretty, let's say, hefty, like, there's there's a lot of pressures from a lot of places in a bigger organization. And I think that that probably is what leads to some of that challenge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, totally. And, and, you know, we, we should always remember, too, they, they have compliance staff sometimes in the hundreds of people. And so they can also absorb these types of changes really well. And they've been working on these things now for a year. It's not like it's catching them off guard. And so they'll they'll do a good job of dealing with it. Yeah, that's true. Should be no surprises here. Ed, do you have any follow-on comments there? Uh, I agree with everything Curtis said. Um, what I would comment on is the idea of PBR principle-based regulation is that it is vague, but all professionals operate in that realm. I look at the rules that uh, I have to follow as a lawyer. They do not set them out in clear, bright line um, explanations. It's more left to the professional judgment. So I think when you look at client-focused reforms as an example of PBR, it is exactly that. It's leaving it to the professional to make the judgment call that professionals have to make. So you're really separating the camp now between people who truly want to be professional 
and people who are more interested in sales. And there's nothing wrong with being interested in sales if that's what you want, but that has to be clearly delineated and the rules should apply differently to people who wanna just be in sales. Whereas when I look at client focused reforms, the opportunity for the profession to embrace this next step forward is right for them. And I would just note that I've been receiving a couple of calls over the past uh, little while because client focused reforms are coming into being. And, and what I'm hearing, <laughs> hey there. A second. Sure. Yeah. Can you push me on my bike? I can't, I'm in an interview right now. <laughs> yeah, I can. All right, you guys have to go outside. Can Are you right? go? Out? Uh, no, don't don't want to race that. No. <laughs> All right, can you guys go back outside? We have two sick grandchildren at home yeah. with us today. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Go outside now. No. Yeah, you have to. No, no, no. no yeah, because no. we're on. See, say you can say hi to Ed and Curtis. Hi there. <laughs> or you can do that. All right. Hi. <laughs> I've got it. Sorry, let's hear, come on guys. No, I can't, I can't, I have to finish this. Hey, bye guys. So, Ed, uh, I know you have some follow-on comments here about uh, Curtis's perspective on the CFR. Can you uh, hit us with those? Sure, absolutely. And, and I agree with, pardon me, <clears throat> I agree with um, everything that Curtis has said. So when you're talking about um, accomplishing the intended outcome, um, you have to recognize that principles-based regulation by its very nature is not a bright line test. It leaves uh, matters open for professional interpretation. And we're talking about um, raising the professional bar for financial advisors. Um, and certainly client-focused reforms is a great example of principles-based regulation and operation and the opportunity for the advisor and planner to step forward and really assert their professionalism. When you look at lawyers or doctors, the rules that govern our conduct and what we have to do with our clients are not bright line tests. They are left to interpretation by us as professionals. And if we interpret wrong, we're gonna be held accountable for that. Similarly, when you look at client-focused reforms, it's the same mechanism. The professional advisor is going to have to become comfortable with dealing with the gray areas and making the calls. What this will do though, is certainly separate those who wanna be salespeople versus those who want to be professional advisors and planners. And there's nothing wrong with being a salesperson. However, the rules governing how the sales versus the professional operates have to be very clear and well delineated. Um, and I have received some phone calls recently from financial advisors who are you know, preparing and anticipating the client focus reforms saying, you know, I'm concerned. Like there's just no clear um, answers to the questions on what they're expecting. Um, and when I've been teaching this to the um, law students at Osgood, when I went over the class focus reforms, I got the same thing. Well, hang on, where's the bright line test, Ed? We're used to the letter of the law standing. And the response was, well, that's the change with principles-based regulation. You will have to become comfortable with the interpretation. Um, so as a financial advisor, as a professional financial advisor, that's just your new reality. As a lawyer who may be supporting the financial advisor, again, you need the experience and the understanding to provide guidance. And that's what's missing, I think, is really um, any sort of entity stepping forward and saying, we can assist the advisor and planner um, with guidance during this process. Curtis, you have follow-on comments there? Um, I would suggest that every advisor takes the time to Google and look up um, the day's question and answer document that they've created for mutual fund dealers. Uh, they're giving guidance in terms of what uh, the interpretation of what they expect from the client's focused reforms. And one thing you'll notice is, is they talk about in there uh, several times that the financial advisors is expected to use, and they use the term professional judgment. And so that's coming right from the regulator now. And 
if you will, bestowing upon the financial advisor, the registrant, to, to use professional judgment. Um, this is, as Ed has said, this is a, this is a shift. Um, before the attitude was, here, here it is, A, B, C, D, do A, B, C, D. You know, and, and now they're saying, here's our expected outcome, and we expect you to actually engage your brain and, and do something with it. So this is a good thing. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead, Ed. Sorry. So Jason, and, and if I could just pick up on a comment that um, Curtis has made with respect to the dealers. The fact that a financial event advisor and financial planner has to be sponsored by a dealer, and the dealer is a business entity, as is the financial advisor, you've had the delegation of responsibility and authority then from IROC or the MFDA to a dealer, and the dealer's interests are not aligned always with the advisor's interest. So when you're talking about developing a profession, that conflict of interest that exists between the dealer and the other business entity, the financial advisor, may result in outcomes, unintended consequences that are not in the best interest of the consumer, the investor. Therefore, I think in the coming years, and I think it's going to be starting now that conversation, it's going to be, as we develop the profession, as we have these credentialing bodies coming forward, and although IROC and the MFDA are potentially credentialing bodies, there's going to have to be some sort of uh, rethinking about that relationship of the dealer and the advisor. And certainly, if you're talking about professionalism, then the advisors and the planners have to be removed, I think, at some point from the oversight of a dealer. So going back to the, the principles-based regulation here, and how much should advisors be concerned, or dealers for that matter, uh, be concerned about sort of a pendulum where, you know, like what looks like one fact set today leads to an advisor getting punishment A, and then a year from now, advisor B, who seems to have done the same thing, gets punishment B? That's an excellent question. Um, and there's a recent Supreme Court of Canada case that came out just this year called Vavilov. And in that case, the um, Supreme Court has examined the concept of, of correctness versus reasonableness in terms of a decision by um, an administrative body. And part of what they're looking at and considering is the past decisions of the adjudicative body. Adjudicative bodies, though, in the administrative law field are not bound by the decisions made previously. So Vavilov has taken the standard of reasonableness and it sort of tweaked it a bit. And we don't know what the outcome is going to be. But what they are saying is the, the rulings have to be logical and reasonable. And the court will be looking at past decisions as well. So when you apply that then to the actions of the adjudicative committees, what you're seeing from the adjudicators at the regulatory level is they are now being more careful in trying to structure decisions with the eye of watching what has been said by the same body um, in the past to, to ensure greater consistency. So then how does that apply directly to your question? I think what you will see is uh, um, a better outcome in terms of consistency with the decisions of administrative tribunals and not seeing such a variation, you know, the same error resulting in such diverse outcomes. Um, and the caveat to that would be the facts of every case really impact the decisions as well. So you will see a focus on the facts. So if you do see uh, similar cases where the outcomes are different, you would really have to look at the fact pattern um, and that's certainly what the Supreme Court would do if it was brought forward for an appeal for judicial review. That's that's great. That's a really good summary. I feel like we got a taste of law school right there. Um, <laughs> Curtis, do you have any uh, follow-on comments there? I'm just going to actually take a couple of things that has talked about and tie them together sort of from a practical industry experience yes. point of view. Um, 
the review of potentially having the advisor not be so directly linked and supervised to this extent by their dealer, where the rubber really meets the road is in my role in compliance, I had a chance to observe several times where a client would come forward with what I thought was a legitimate complaint about an outcome that had occurred. Now you've got one errors and emissions company that is sponsored by the dealer and the advisor's ENO is on that plan. And lawyers representing the best interests of who? Dealer or the advisor? And I can tell you over and over and over again, I saw advisors, I'm not gonna say be thrown under the bus, but the wheels were sure turning. And you know, far too often, um, dealers were, were basically treated like, well, they can't do anything wrong. Uh, so it has to be the advisor's fault. And so when you start looking at tribunals, having the connection where they're always treated like the same entity, the advisor is basically chattel, an agent or an employee of the dealer. Sometimes that's not fair because there are times that I witnessed where I would have thought the advisor didn't do much wrong at all. And quite often, you know, the errors could have been occurred in systems related issues at the dealer. Could be right in the reporting, could be in the process engine that does the transaction. Doesn't have to be a human error. Could I just comment on Curtis's comment, on my comment? Please, yeah, I had, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I agree with what Curtis is saying and not that I wanna be defending either the dealer or the advisor, um, the dealer's actions as well are predicated on the model that they're operating in. I think the dealers may be perfectly happy to, to transition to a model where they don't have oversight of the advisor and they don't have that responsibility. So I think there's an alignment potentially there um, in this conflict where I think both the dealer and the advisor and planner would be saying, let's go to the regulator, the senior regulator and discuss this because it's not working for us. The dealer, of course, when they get into these messy situations are looking to protect their own interests, not the advisor's interests. So again, they're gonna do what's right by them as opposed to what's right for the advisor and who's left in the lurch in those situations often is the investor or the consumer. So. Yeah, it's curious because I know there was just news out of the United States that uh, Charles Schwab, which is a huge wirehouse, kind of equivalent to our bank owned securities firms. Um, and they just told all of their advisors to go get their own e &O insurance. So it, funny, Curtis, your comment about that made me think of that recent headline. Now, both of you referred, I think, rightly to the client in this or the investor, you said, Ed, right? The the consumer, the client, how does this ultimately help the client? And I, you gave us a good example here, Ed, with maybe a little bit of a clearer delineation of, let's say, legal responsibilities. Um, Curtis, do you have any other thoughts about how CFR will make better client outcomes? <laughs> or won't? Well, fingers crossed that there are some. Uh, that would be the first thing. Um, so I would say if, if you're an, an investor and you've got currently a risk tolerance level, but nobody has really measured or really thought about what the impact might be if you were to lose money in your account, uh, what the range of losses that you could assimilate okay with, uh, would be, you might feel pretty relieved to hear that the industry has finally decided to wake up to the fact that you know, it might matter. And, and yeah. so as, as advisors, um, sometimes you see quite an emotional reaction when a market turns down. And yet other people don't react very much. You know, and I would think there's probably a relationship between the emotional response and their ability to withstand the loss. Yet we've never really quantified that. So, you know, I'll just say, though, on behalf of the industry, it's going to take time to figure out how to quantify this. I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, this is missing and it's been missing that it's missing. It's another thing to figure out exactly how we're going to go about doing it and getting it right. So there's, there's going to be some time involved here. 
Yeah, I think there are good tools out there now. And I think what we're going to see is a lot of the time is going to be around figuring out what tools are optimal and adopting those tools. But you know, we have academic research in this area going back at least a couple of decades now. I can look at a fellow like John Grable out of Georgia, who does, uh, who's, I think, uh, maybe 2001 is his first paper on the matter, or Terence O'Dean at, uh, at San Diego State. I can't remember where Terence is. But anyways, yeah, there's absolutely the case here. Ed, uh, any other thoughts about how consumers are or are not protected here? Uh, the consumer is almost naked um, in many respects when you when you look at the client focused performance because they don't have an understanding that um, this is when you talk about the trust that they have in their financial advisor and planner. So the outcome positive or negative will really depend on how it's embraced by the advisor community. Um, and again, I think the, the one risk I would say to the consumer is the person who wants to operate more on a sales um, path as opposed to an advice path. In those situations, you could have a consumer who thinks they're getting all of the protections that they might from, you know, when the media talks about the client focus performs a professionalism. Um, you know, it's not pervasive in the entire industry, that concept of professionalism. So the client could be um, unintentionally harmed. This is like the old, uh, the Tony Robbins skit where he goes out on Times Square and asks people if their advisor's a fiduciary. Something like that. Yeah, gotcha. Okay. Um, Jason, can I just add one thing? Um, sometimes, you know, great intentions lead to bad outcomes. And I, my, my own worry about this is while we're having advisors spend a great deal of time talking to the, the client about all their potential uh, conflicts of interest and here I'm disclosing all of this to you and here's all the things we're going to do to settle this to, to your satisfaction, while we're doing all of that, we're using up all the oxygen in the room. And the purpose of the meeting is for the advisor to listen to the client to talk about what they want to talk about. And, and I, I do worry that, you know, sometimes the best way to know your client is to shut up and listen to them. And, and the biggest problem we're, we're finding here is I think advisors are going to be doing all the talking. Yeah, I hope that's not true. I, and I think this goes back to Ed comment, Ed's comment earlier about you know, kind of finding the right balance based on industry standards. Um, and, but that being said, there's not like within CFR, there's no principle, at least not that I've seen that says the you know, advisor should be you know, talking 20% of the time and the client 80% or something like that. Maybe that would be a, a principle to add in there. I don't know. Ed, uh, do you have, Follow on comments. One more, yeah, yeah, one more comment about that, and it's it's something I think the industry has missed, um, and it was a huge opportunity. Client focused reforms go back to like 2010, um, and when it came out, there was also the you know the push for principles based regulation. It was pointed out at that time that the result of the reforms to the client focus reforms, as well as doing it in a principles based um, environment would result in a lot of gray area. And advisors not accustomed to that would be looking to associations to provide guidance. It was a huge opportunity for associations in the industry to step forward and provide guidance. And when you look at you know, other um, global attempts at principles-based regulation, the industry actually stepped up and pushed for the reforms but made sure they provided the background and the guidance for the participants. That's something that the industry associations in Canada have not done. They've done a lot of things right, but that was a big miss in my mind. And that's part of the gap we're now seeing is that the advisor doesn't have the professional body that can provide the guidance that every other professional has. Interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair point that we don't have kind of a like how to be a financial advisor guide anywhere. You you know you can maybe look at what you did in your basic education courses, but we don't do a ton of discussion around practice management. I know at least in my core curriculum. So yeah, it's a it's a good point, Ed. Where is that kind of like here's here's just how to how to run a practice. So Curtis. 
Nothing to add. I, I agree. Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting comment. I like that. Now, we've talked a little bit about sort of the vulnerability for advisors. Do, you, do either of you think that there are, maybe I'll start with uh, Curtis here, because you come from that advisory background. Do you think there are business models that are particularly vulnerable? Are there you know, folks out there that, that really do have to go back and revamp their whole business based on um, CFR or maybe on title protection that Ed has referred to as well? I'm not sure if I'd say they have to go back and revamp their entire business structure, but I, I do think there's going to be some that are, that are impacted by this. Um, you know, just, just to give you just a sense of them. So let's say you operate a dealer and the whole purpose of, of your dealer is really just to sell proprietary products. Maybe your shareholder, manufacturer, and you've been offering these third-party funds almost like a bait and switch. But, but if you look inside the dealer, 80% of all transactions are your own proprietary stuff. Well, you may have to reconsider that because now you're gonna be required to at least discuss the third party solutions. You're gonna to have to, uh, if you're an advisor, I think you've got to put on your, your big boy pants really and, and take a look and say, okay, is this product the right thing for my client? And you know, I could get into a lengthy discussion about how these types of organizations um, exist and, and how you go about training an entire distribution channel just to sell proprietary products. Um, but at the end of the day, some proprietary products are very good products, and frankly, some of them aren't. They're just overpriced. And so um, I, I think that's both a good outcome, and I do think there's some pressure there on that particular model. Uh, another one that comes to mind is if you're a desk fee type dealer where you don't receive any portion of the revenue generated by the sales uh, on the commission grid, Instead, you're just charging a flat fee every month. Well, your costs are always escalating. They go up with inflation. Uh, but every time there's a large dump of additional tasks that are put on a dealer, typically costs go up again. You're hiring more compliance staff. You're, you're, you're increasing your system's costs even more. Supervision, your audit costs, everything is rising. And yet your revenue is not. And, and for some of them, th this is going to be a challenge, sure. Um, another one that would come to mind is any small dealer that doesn't have a large volume of advisors, a large volume of, of um, revenue, uh, so a relatively small dealer. Some of the costs of this project, of course, are fixed costs. You have to create the systems, you have to create the manuals, you have to do the training, you have to get your executive and your staff all up to speed. And those costs are somewhat the same for all the dealers, whether you have 100 people in your compliance department or 15. So you, you can really see that some firms are going to be able to absorb this relatively efficiently. And like I said before, they've had a lot of time to think about it. But I think others are going to be struggling. And, and so I think all of those are, are somewhat impacted by this. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, the economies of scale do tend to favor those who, uh, those who can change more quickly, right? So yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Ed, any thoughts there? Um, mine is uh, more high level uh, than Curtis's detailed analysis, which of course is always worth listening to. Um, when I look at the business models, I think under the client-focused reforms, um, pressure is going to be um, brought to the um, third-party commissions coming from the product manufacturers. And the reason I say that is um, the client-focused reform has clearly stated that remuneration is a material conflict of interest. And then they go on to say a material conflict of interest must be resolved in the best interest of the client. And now taking that and applying it to the common law fiduciary duty again, while the regulators are saying, well, we're using the best interest of the client, but we don't mean it's a fiduciary duty. Well, there's an ambiguity here now. And what happens when you have ambiguities? The courts are gonna decide it. 
So if it goes to the Supreme Court, you know, through the courts up to the Supreme Court to make a decision on, you know, what is a material conflict of interest and how do you identify it, they have set out, um, they have several cases that set out exactly what they're looking at. And one of the principles that they look at is industry practices, codes of conduct, um, and the expectations within the industry. So if you're looking then at IROC or the MFDA as a credentialing body um, that is saying material conflicts have to be solved in the best interest of a client, it seems to me it puts at risk the, uh, the concept of uh, third party commissions and the model that based on that. And this would be an interesting outcome. And I, I, I think you're right to say this is not gonna change right away, but who knows where the, uh, yeah, where the Supreme Court ultimately lands us on this. And they don't understand the industry. And that's, that's the scary part. Courts generally don't understand the industry, yet they're making decisions that will really impact the operations. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so I have one last question I think I'll, let, I'll uh, end us on here. And I do see a little bit of this, although I saw a lot of it maybe five or six years ago. So you both come from a background where you dealt with both insurance and investment side of the house. And I see some folks and I, I haven't, I'm surprised actually, I haven't heard this in, in the light of CFR, but I have seen folks who say, I'm gonna dump my securities license and I'm gonna go insurance licensed only, I'll deal with seg funds and you know maybe a robo advisor or a, a third party asset manager of some sort. Is that, something we should be concerned about? Should those advisors be concerned? And then I know that the insurance regulators are, are working on this treating clients fairly model. Is that going to end up really at the same place for insurance advisors as CFR has securities folks right now? Um, I don't know, uh, Curtis, do you have, want to start us off there? That's a broad subject. Uh, we could spend a lot of time on this one. Um, <laughs> So going back, yes, the, the trend is definitely there. A lot of people don't understand how it's occurring at the scale it is. And I can tell you it's occurring to the scale of hundreds of advisors a year across Canada. Um, and what you see when an advisor exits the space, he chooses to give up his registration in, in uh, securities, is you typically see a very large book of business being transferred over to an insurance seg fund book. You know, so there's some of that arbitrage, if you will, um, sliding over to the insurance side. And then you begin to see the larger accounts being uh, sent over to portfolio managers. Now, some, some advisors choose on their own, they say, well, this uh, is feeling burdensome, so I feel like I'll let go of my securities license. Others might say, um, well, I, I just don't like the relationship I have with my dealer, and I think I'll take control of my own career, and I'll go back to the insurance side only. So you'll hear a lot of explanations, but what is forgotten sometimes by the advisor is the impact on the client. Um, these accounts leaving securities and going over to save funds. It may quack like a duck and sound like a duck and therefore you think it's a duck, but they're not the same. One is a security and one is an insurance contract. And I, I think sometimes there's tax consequences involved in these issues far too often that are forgotten. Um, and so I, I do think this trend is accelerating, not decelerating. So, uh, you know, the only thing I've seen slow it down really in the last 10 years, Jason, is, is I've noticed a DSC now is being evaluated and looked at carefully at the MGA level sometimes, and it's also being considered even in insurance back offices. So the idea of just moving around for compensation, I think, is, is slowing down. I'm not sure if I'm really getting at what your, what your point is, but I, I do see this, this uh, structure going on. And um, if I was those advisors, I'd be very nervous for what comes next. Yeah. Right. Because the OSC not long ago signaled that they wanted to do a complete review of uh, referrals. And, uh, you know, that hasn't gone away. They've shelved it in the short term where they've evaluated it. But 
no time have they said, well, we've concluded our study and we're done with that. So that's still sitting on someone's desk for to be picked up and worked on. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and that's a good view from the ground, I think, Curtis. I think what you've given us there is a good summary of sort of the advisor's perspective. Ed, do you have any comments about the treating clients fairly model that might help with this question? Um, that, that's a really excellent question. Um, before I comment on the treating clients fairly, just going back to Curtis's comment about how, um, and your opening comment about how um, advisors are giving up their security side license using their insurance side license, then using a portfolio manager, um, sending the clients to the portfolio manager. <clears throat> That's a really, really dangerous game on the part of the advisor. Um, as Curtis said, the referral arrangement uh, conversation that the OSC uh, will have at some point is on a shelf because they realize it's a big issue and there are a lot of um, substantial business entities involved in this practice as well. But when you look at it from the concept of when do you have to become a registrant um, for the security side, it's a business trigger. Are you in the business of, um, of helping to further a particular trade? And one of the elements they look at is, are you being paid for? Are you doing it regularly? So if you've given up your license and you're still pushing your clients through a portfolio manager and you're collecting a referral fee that may be comparable to your trailer, then I think there's a very strong element that argument that you are in the business and therefore are operating in the securities field when you shouldn't because you're not a registrant. And that is going to be messy when if they come to that conclusion. And as I go through this and I look at it more carefully, I don't know how they can come to any other conclusion but that. Now, when you talk about the client, um, the treating clients fairly element, um, it's, it's that is similar to um, the client focus reforms and they all have at their root, the treating, sorry, what was it? The fair dealing model. <clears throat> when the fair dealing model was coming out um, and being discussed quite some time ago, probably, probably what, 14, 15 years ago, they were saying the elements within that would certainly be applicable to the insurance sector as well. So then, when you talk about will the impact or the, the characteristics of the client focus reform um, be viewed in the treating clients fairly, I think they will be. There's no question that using principles-based regulation again, certainly in Ontario, we're seeing the new FSRA taking a more um, securities approach towards regulation as well. So I think we can conclude that the treating clients fairly does have the, uh, the possibility of um, replicating what we are seeing on the security side as well. Okay, so that's perfect. I normally would ask for final thoughts, but I don't think that we're going to fit those in here. I know one of you has a tight schedule that uh, that I've chewed into now, and I'm concerned about running into your billable hours, Ed. So, um, so thanks very much. You've both been just great. I think we are going to look at doing this again. I hope we can get you both back on again. Anything. And yeah, I think this is a really good look at what's happening on the sort of compliance and regulatory side. Very timely, as we're just going to be by the time this episode goes, just a couple of weeks. So um, thank you to both of you and enjoy the rest of your uh, days. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, thank you, Curtis. Okay, it would be impossible for me to comment on everything I want to comment on from that episode. Um, but I do have a couple of things here. Um, and one thing was Curtis talked about seg funds and the sort of transition to seg funds from mutual funds and this question of uh, advisors dropping the one license and going to a seg fund only practice. And one of the, I think, perceived advantages here is a, a regulatory arbitrage. That is the rules on the seg fund side are lighter. And I just wanna point out then, and I've uh, tweeted about this and so forth, but a couple, uh, months ago now, by the time you listen to this, it'll been a couple months, the Canadian Council of Insurance Regulators released their guidance on the conduct of the insurance business and fair treatment of customers. So in uh, 2017, if my memory serves, uh, the Canadian Council of Insurance Regulators released this fair treatment of customers guidelines 
And the intention here is kind of a first step, very principles based actually, um, to getting the insurance regulatory side to look more like the securities regulatory side. And we can speak about the merits of that. And in fact, um, I've already talked to Curtis and Ed about coming back for a second episode. And I think this is something I would like to delve into with them. Um, but there are some specific comments here that I wanted to highlight that I think are worth considering um, as you sort of make that transition. If you're, if you're thinking, well, I can take advantage of that um, regulatory arbitrage. So the uh, specific comments here. You can tell me if this sounds concerning, but uh, I want to focus on agent training and outsourcing slash delegating arrangements. Uh, so the contractual agreements or supporting documentation between insurers and intermediaries did not outline detailed expectations regarding their roles and responsibilities. And there were no mechanisms in place to provide reasonable assurance that independent agent training was being completed or intermediaries understood and fulfilled their delegated training responsibilities. So I think think that that points to sort of, let's say, an inconsistency on the training side. Of course, I'm going to focus on training being uh, th this is what I do. Um, and then the next item here, incentive management and remuneration structure. And I know this is a place the insurance industry gets picked on a fair bit. And I think that probably the sort of proponents of FTP, oh, sorry, of the Fair Treatment of Customers, FTC, are not happy with this. You can see it in the document. Uh, the structure of incentive programs reviewed predominantly contains sales-related quantitative elements, that is, leaderboards based on apps and so forth, and the application of qualitative criteria based on FTC was not formalized. So what they're saying here is that incentive programs continue to be primarily focused around sales rather than on fair treatment of customers. And there was no supervision processes over, sorry, there were no supervision processes over incentive programs used or developed by intermediaries. So there's a bunch more. And of course, I'll include this in the show notes. But I thought it was interesting, um, honestly, pretty damning report on some of the stuff we see in the insurance industry. And it's not to suggest that um, insurance agents as a whole are doing anything wrong, but I think there is ample room for some cleanup there at the same time. Um, the number for today's episode is seven. The number for today's episode is seven. I hope you'll join me again in two weeks' time. I'll be talking then to John DeGuy. John is a well-known commentator on a whole bunch of issues. We're going to talk with him about fiduciary duty and about stock market bubbles. So I hope you'll join us again in two weeks. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us. You'll be able to do your quiz by creating an account and subscribing for $15 a month or $150 a year at businesscareercollege.com. Those who subscribe on an annual basis will also have access to three half-day continuing education seminars covering a variety of topics and capturing a range of different continuing education credit requirements. In order to get your credits for this episode, you'll have to do a short five question quiz. You'll need the number that I went over just after the interview, the object that I displayed at the beginning of the interview, and you'll also have to recall a few details, nothing too challenging from the episode. Once you have completed the quiz, within the course where you did the quiz, you'll be able to click at the top right corner and from there, you'll be able to choose the option to view wall certificate. That's how you'll see your CE credits. Hang on to that, although the system will hang on to it as well. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of a few people in getting this episode to air. Jocelyn Lord, Rennie Wong, and Sushami Pamela-Paquette are the amazing marketing team at We Know Training, which is Business Career College's parent company. Sush also does our video content. Joseph Tong composed the theme music and does the sound editing for every episode, as well as uploads the episodes to all audio platforms. Maria Nguyen takes care of all our CE approvals.